Good evening. The Lord be with you. My name is Gordon Smith. I serve as the president of Ambrose University, and it's my distinct pleasure on behalf of the faculty of the university to welcome you to this year's edition of the Downey Lectures. We welcome you to this particular piece of land, this particular piece of soil. We are located on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot people. This is Region 7 in southern Alberta, Treaty 7. It includes the Siksika, the Pikuni, the Kanai, the Tutsina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. We are also here at the West Hills, just west of the intersection of the Bow River and the Elbow River. This is the city of Calgary that is also home to Métis Nation number three. We gather this evening, as I mentioned, to celebrate the work of, of Arnold, not Arnold Downey, Murray Downey, pardon me, of Murray Downey. And this lectureship is named after him. He was one of the original founders of one of the earlier iterations of Ambrose University, way back when one iteration was known as the Western Canadian Bible Institute. It's a little touching for me because my parents studied under this man, Murray Downey, who taught theology, Bible, and evangelism in that earlier iteration for 31 years. And we are honored to have this series of lectures that celebrate his legacy and its impact in the lives of those who have gone before us. We are pleased to welcome one and all here this evening. Thank you very much for joining us in all the midst of the complexities of the pandemic and all the needs for restrictions, but we know that some have chosen to join us live. We're live streamed this evening, and if you're watching in, welcome to you as well. Thank you for joining us. We are confident you will find this to be a fruitful and generative evening. Come on in, Brother Snow. Brothers, plural, Snow, join us. It is our practice that uh, a member of the Faculty of Theology at Ambrose University each year is given the opportunity to take the lead on who will be the person that's invited to serve as the guest lecturer. And this year, no surprise, I suspect, for those of you that know Dr. Christina Conroy, she's taken the opportunity to invite our guest this year, who is the Reverend Dr. Dr. Ray Aldred, a husband, a father, and a grandfather, an ordained minister with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, one of the sponsoring denominations of this university. He's status Cree from the Swan River Band, Treaty 8 in Northern Alberta. Formerly, Ray served as assistant professor of theology here at Ambrose Seminary, and so it's a special treat for us to be able to welcome back a colleague. He's a former also chair and board member of Indigenous Pathways. He's also former director for First Nations Alliance Churches here in Canada, and now a committee member with them, where he works and is committed to encourage Indigenous congregations as they seek to flourish. Currently, Ray is the director of the Indigenous Studies Program at the Vancouver School of Theology, whose mission is to partner with Indigenous churches around theological education. And we've been alerted that colleagues and friends from Vancouver School of Theology and some of his students are watching online. A special welcome to each of you. Ray, it is a distinct treat to welcome you here. Welcome. I'm gonna, I got more material than I can get through, so I'm just going to talk for 45 minutes and I'll stop. <laughs> Mid-sentence. No, I'm gonna, well, I'll, I'll see. So I'm thankful for this opportunity from my alma mater to present at these Downey Lectures. I'm thankful for the education that I received from all my professors but I'm, I'm even more thankful for the formation that occurred as I interacted with all those who made up the community that was then Canadian Bible College and Canadian Theological Seminary, which later became Ambrose Seminary and Ambrose University. 
COVID has taught me, as I'm sure that it taught you, that it is the ancillary learning that is as important as the material that is in, now in my day it was in the professor's three ring binder and now it's on an iPad. But the ancillary learning, the stuff that's on the edges, if you want a piece of advice, you have to listen to the voices that are at the edge of the conversation. I'm not talking about conspiracy theorists, you know, who inundate us with all kinds of propaganda. I'm talking about the wisdom that are there if you listen for them. The wisdom that helps you to understand. And for me, those voices came from the first peoples, the first nations, the Métis and the Winwit. But it also came in the voices of professors who would make these comments that caused me to think again about what I was doing as an inspiring biblical scholar and theologian and minister. And I want to mention two by way of example because they helped me see things in different ways. And they both made these comments Near the end of a course that caused me to think in different ways and prove formative, Dr. Joanne Badley uh, taught me Greek exegesis and I remember the first semester of Greek exegesis and writing things down as Andy Reimer and Greg Gruno and Dr. Badley had these conversations that none of the rest of us even knew what they were talking about, <laughs> talking about inceptive errors and conative errors and they would just go on and we'd just write stuff down because we didn't know what they were saying hoping that at some point I'll get, I'll get it, because I couldn't see that. I couldn't, that's in, I can't see it in the text. I just can't. And then later, the, and it was near the end of January, second term, Greek exegesis 2, and I saw John was trying to baptize Jesus, maybe an inceptive aorist, attempted activity maybe, or something like that. And I just remembered, ah, I can, have a, I can be part of the conversation. But the comment I'm talking about is near the edge... Near the end of the course, after having done an exegetical commentary on a few verses in Colossians, Joanne made this statement. She said, maybe it's just all about the gospel. She just made that statement. And I thought about that, and it stuck with me, and it became essential for what I was doing in ministry among indigenous people. It was all about the gospel and the gospels, the story of Jesus Christ that we take in and it takes us in. The second professor I want to mention is Mabio Kenzo, and it was reading in his class on post-modernity that shifted my thinking on decolonization and indigenization, although I'm not sure those things were mentioned. Post-modernity was helpful because it enabled me to go beyond the boundaries of what, what had become almost a colonial magisterium with regard to church structure and theology and the Western world. Paul Lakeland writing, Paul Lakeland in a book I had to read called Fragmented Cultures makes this small comment on postmodernity. He says it proves emancipatory for some cultures because you can talk about things that you couldn't talk about before. And that was happening in Canada beginning probably in the early 19, late 1960s, I know. And then, but you could talk about what was going on. And then... To be fair to Lakeland, he also cautions that some of the forces at work in our deconstructive glee may prove to be demonic. And I said, and anybody who isn't aware of that is prone to be one of those categories. And then, and then I wrote a paper in Kenzo's class entitled, it was a great title, I still whip it out at class and say, here, this is the title, A Communal Theology of a Shame-Based Culture Based on a Hermeneutic of a Non-Objective Text. I use that when I want to make some guys pissed off about stuff. <laughs> I won't say which group. The comment at the end of the class or later that shifted my thinking for my doctoral thesis was that if you like George Lindbeck, you like, you'll love Paul Ricoeur. And so then it just shifted this thing. From Kenzo and Paul Ricoeur, I learned it's not outright to not outright reject an idea, but stand back and see what is right about something as well as how it could use some innovation. It also, we all move forward with metaphors and language when we have been taught with the languages and the metaphors we've been taught, but we have an opportunity to shift the language and in this way not succumb to de deconstruction but make new hope statements. I've named those two professors, but I'm thankful for all my professors. 
Rod Remen for teaching me that it's not in, you don't learn Greek by getting a sheet that the professor hands you that has all the nouns declined and the verbs conjugated. You learn by doing it, by making the sheet yourself. You learn by translating. Tony, Tony Cummings mentioned the phrase, a hermeneutic of love. Norma then Bailey for making me read all those devotional life books and Joan Carter for introducing me to the writing of Henry Nouwen, and Sandy Eyre for knowing where to find every obscure book in the universe. I'm thankful for this school, and I'm thankful for this opportunity. And I want to now shift slightly to think about this first lecture, which I entitled, Treaty as a Shared Narrative, Indigenous Treaty as Canada's Creation Story. This lecture flows out of the writing of my thesis, in my doctoral thesis, but I, that was one of the critiques the examiners had, is I just mention it, but I don't really go into it in a great detail. The treaty could be a shared narrative. And so my premise, I called my thesis an alternative starting place for an indigenous theology. The main premise was that if you began with indigenous communal narrative identity, that it would invigorate theology in ways that has that had been stunted in the past, that a modern evangelical theology had been trapped in these particular ways of thinking and that indigenous communal identity could help. If you started there, you could get to someplace different that would be helpful. Whereas Western theology, or at least popular Western theology, began with the alienated individual of modern thought, thanks to Rene Descartes, thinking being cut off thinking that being cut off from mother, father, and all else except doubt seemed to, which in essence reduced identity to a thinking being. Descartes then moves, Descartes does this thing where he proves, he proves his own existence by doubting, I think therefore I am, and then he offers a proof for God and then believes with God and me we can prove anything. And I think much of Western theology did that for a long time, did that for a long time. So then, Western theology then seems to begin with a similar starting point as many seem to begin with the alienated individual in Genesis chapter three, with the effects of the curse impacting every relationship, relationship with human beings, relationship with the creator and spiritual beings, and relationship with the land itself. This was caricatured in some younger evangelical theologies that painted human beings as being alienated from everyone in the world, a dangerous demonic place that needed to be waged war against. Christian faith would then usher in a new period where people had lots of friends, complete healing, and lots of money to help others with. Your churches would grow, your influence would grow, and through this steady advance of individual salvation, you would win the day and fly away to God's celestial shore, someplace out there. What was forefront, forefront, it seemed to me, was the preoccupation with this solitary, autonomous individual. And I thought that if you began with indigenous communal identity, we might get to a different place. Indigenous identity tended to be communal, especially on the northern plains, tended to be communal because we believe that we are related to the earth. The Cree cross cosmology begins with, it's a good world. The Cherokee begin the day by finding water and giving thanks. It begins not with alienation, but it begins with harmony. Not a harmony that is apathetic and devoid of tension, that so much, so many in our world, when they think of harmony, they think of sort of an apathetic, tension-free existence, and, so that, and, they, and they, they describe that as the good life, but this is an act of harmony that must be stewarded, but it begins with a good world and the creator who placed us upon this territory. The boundaries of our world are maintained by our stories. Stories we tell help us to see the unseen, understand our place or the space we occupy, and give us the laws that guide us to understand how we are to live out this harmony that has been given to us. And as I was doing my thesis, I was struck by how indigenous treaty making was an outflow of this indigenous communal identity, a communal identity that did not devolve into tribalism, was open, in, was open to the newcomer and seemed to 
contrary to our current cultural milieu, it seems in, that the current cultural milieu seems intent on trying to block out all those that are different than us. Indigenous identity seem to make room for the other and for the newcomer. Indigenous treaty was a process that seemed to flow out from the harmony that flowed from creation. I've also been thinking about the tasks that I think the church should be engaged in that would help continue to move us towards reconciliation. As I've already stated, the preoccupation with individual salvation by the neo-Christendom church has meant that for popular theology in much of North America has thought little about reconciliation, even though that's the whole point of salvation. Having said this, there are some good examples of churches that have understand that salvation is all about Christ reconciling all things, creator and creation in perfect harmony. Yet many within the church spend a significant amount of time to continue to argue about who is the greatest. Or as the dominant church spend much of their time pointing out their distinctives, which usually translate into denominational distinctives. These are usually answers to questions that no one is asking, and we quickly forget that the canons of the church are not there to bind, but to help discern how we live out our life in relationship with all our relatives. We, however, in the dominant church have tended to interpret canon as law to beat down insurrection to church authority. The question that people have been asking of the church during this time, when we find when we are finding the unmarked graves of the residential school, and when the residential school survivors speak, marginalized people revealing the multi-generational trauma, and in the middle of which the church is situated, and the question that people ask continues to be, where is God in all of this? How do we heal in Canada? The indigenous church asks, how do we transform ourselves through healing? The non-indigenous church tends to ask, what should we do? Most of the time when I go to speak to non-indigenous people, that's the question. They never ask, who should I be? Or how could I change? They always ask, what should we do? What can I do? So I came up with three things that you can do. Three kinds of things. And I'm weaving this into the talk, so I'm going to pick this up. I hope this makes sense by the end. So then the three things that I've been using, thinking about most of the times that I'm speaking this year, one is heal the land. The revealing of unmarked graves could be heard as a prophetic call, I thought. Howard Jolly, a good friend of mine and now the current director of the First Nations Alliance Churches of Canada, he sang me part of a song recently that he's working on about the unmarked graves. And he ties it to the words of God to Cain. When God says, where's your brother, Abel? And Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord says, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. The wound upon the first peoples is a wound upon the land. And a wound upon the land is a wound upon human beings. We need to be working to heal the land. This again is seen in Christ, which I plan to go into a bit more tomorrow, but we need to heal the land. The challenge that indigenous thought and vision makes, however, to dominant Canadian society and the church is to expand what this means. When I talk about healing the land to the dominant Western church, immediately people jump to the category of ecology or earth care, which is good, it's helpful, but it could also be just a diversion or a way to, to salve the legitimate shame that continues to needle the soul of Canada as they fail to honor the treaties and continue to attack the relationships of human beings and indigenous people have with the land. There needs to be a holistic approach to this, healing the land. You need to develop or raise emotional intelligence. So people say, what should I do? Raise your emotional intelligence or develop some emotional intelligence. Because most men like me, I'm 61, they only have three words for their emotions. Mad, glad, and sad, that's it. And if it doesn't fall into one of those three words, then they don't know how to express themselves. But we need to develop 
emotional intelligence. The multi-generational trauma that Indigenous people have been through has not been part of the mainstream theological conversation of the church, although it's been part of the conversation of the majority church, two-thirds world church, who have been the objects of colonialism and globalization or westernization. North American theology has continued to proliferate a theology that promises posterity by the use of violence to advance these ends. In Canada, at least the finding of unmarked graves near former residential schools, the majority church, even as these graves were found, the majority church has engaged in a form of gaslighting, blaming the economically and socially marginalized for their own problems, blaming them for not embracing the prosperity gospel that would solve all their problems. The other form of denial engaged in by the church is to make half-healed people Half Healed, I get from a book by Renee, Renee Alston talking about, it's called Stumbling Towards Faith. But another, the church engages, they pretend that everything is okay before, they, before you, you have to pretend that everything is okay before you can participate in ministry in the church. Even though we follow a savior who is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, the church in North America, because of its spirituality of numbness, lacks the emotional intelligence to provide a theology that sees the damaged individual as having, every, as having anything to offer. Dr. Martin Brokenleg talked to us, indigenous people, about the need to rebuild our emotional intelligence so that we can continue to speak from the heart and help our children and grandchildren to develop the emotional resources to live in our world the Western church, however, tends to rely on sin management techniques and forms of escapism through consumer-driven glory barns. They treat damaged people as problems to be solved with the result that most Canadians have been paternalistic at best in their thinking and treatment of Indigenous people. We need to shift that. Together we need to rediscover the truth that three women have been teaching me since I was about 51 that our feelings are not trying to hurt us, but they're trying to heal us, that the Creator gave us those things. And if we could just learn to hear what they're saying, we need to develop emotional intelligence. Thirdly, we need to cast a vision of unity that is neither tribalism or a new imperialism. Paul Ricoeur, in an essay talking about embracing, he talks about, in a, in a social essay by Paul Ricoeur, he talks about the problem with the nation state that it's a hindrance to this unity that the Creator is trying to bring in the whole world because it presumes, it has, the nation state tends to presume that it has the authority to make this a reality in the world. And what they do is they end up, as Leslie Newbigin points to in the foolishness of the Greeks, they presume to bring the, heaven, the kingdom of heaven to earth and they end up bringing hell up instead. We need to embrace that it's God's intention as we move toward one another to live in harmony with the Creator and all creation. The problem with nation states and I think denominations is that they presume that their particular expression of Christian faith is the one that God intended for everyone. I'm not against denominations per se, but in their institutional form they tend towards being a power and principality that uses coercion as a way of maintaining control. The TRC raises this issue in action item 60 in calling for churches to educate clergy to stop engaging in religious violence by dividing communities along religious lines. We need to cast a vision that affirms the personhood of all human beings. To call to, the call to continue to pursue reconciliation comes, comes primarily from indigenous people because they see the effects of the strain of trauma in our communities. Perhaps, perhaps if dominant society has communities of people who live insular lives and have achieved or perfected the ability to remove tension from their daily existence, the goal, Jacques Ellul says, that's the goal of the modern life. Reconciliation and unity seem too much to pursue. But the elders continue to put forward the need to pursue and affirm the treaty relationship, a unity. This is evident in the TRC's final report as well as my times listening to the discussion of the elders. Having said this, the church must give up the need to be in control of the process of reconciliation. 
Again, since the only power available to most head offices of institutions is the power of coercion, they tend to try to use that power to enforce unity. This imperialism or neo-colonialism, colonialism or in the church's case, they shame people illegitimately at times to get along. There needs to be, we need to work toward a unity that does not devolve into tribalism as defined by authors like Marty San or Svetson Todorov. The, the latter, Todorov, does a good job of pointing out that some forms of conservatism are enemies of democracy and unity because they enforce a particular form of identity upon all the members of the human race. One, that their own conservatism defines and dictates and that increasingly enough looks just like, interestingly enough, just looks exactly like themselves. Carl Barth, would, Carl Barth would warn us of the dangers of declaring ourselves righteous and everyone else unrighteous. We need to, we have, we need to work towards unity. And we have, I believe in Canada, an opportunity to build unity within this country founded upon two resources accessible to everyone both of which indigenous people identify as having some innate spirituality or sacredness, the historic treaty process and creation. The focus of tonight's lecture will be on the spirituality and treaty as a shared narrative in Canada's creation story. If you listen to indigenous creation stories, they talk about their relationship to the earth. They speak of how they came to be upon the land or upon the sea. When I use the, when I use the term land, aski, it's in Cree. I'm using a shorthand for creation. And creation is the context of life. There is no life apart from creation. This simple truth permeates indigenous understanding. Vine Deloria and other indigenous scholars note that indigenous philosophy is based primarily upon our lived experience and that of all of our relatives. The land is full of life. In Cree, the word for spirit and life is the same word because all of life, because all of life is full of spirit. I'm not debating at this point whether this means trees have souls, but I understand that trees communicate with one another. The tree whose European name is the Douglas fir, I learned while living on the West Coast, communicates with the other Douglas fir, especially when fire is close and it communicates to the rest of the trees in the forest, and they begin to develop a natural fire retardant in their bark and in their needles. One elder said to me, we understand that even a rock is full of life, and if you look at it under the microscope, you'll see all the life that is living on that rock. Our identity flows from our creation story. The creation stories are handed down to us from the elders. The elders have local personal knowledge of the land and teach us about the land. This local knowledge of the land includes their experience of residential school, of the oral histories of the specific treaty negotiations, all of which prove quite accurate at points. The elders also relate to us the mythical stories that take in all time and all space. This does not mean, however, that these, words are, these stories are unreal so we do not call them myths, but we call them legends. Together, these stories taught by our elders give us a shared communal memory that leads to a shared ontology. This is contra, to, as I said, to the Western world's, part, particularly the academy that leans towards viewing religion through the lens of phenomenology of an autonomous individual and relegates all spirituality to the margins of reality or actually to the realm of the unreal and invisible. Religion and knowledge then is moved into the interworld, inner world of abstract knowledge, the knowledge with the academy and its world of abstract knowledge has been, has been, the weakness of this has been it's the academy's inability to write so most folks in society see the relevance of what they're doing. J.R. Miller in writing about the reconcili pro, reconciliation process in Canada states at the academy, and I think he's talking about theologians and biblical studies folk, do not write in a manner that is accessible to people to understand what, how, what could be helpful in Beauty, the beauty with creation stories is that as we understand how we came to be on the earth, we can feel the earth welcome us home. 
as indigenous scholars Neil McLeod says. I had the privilege of listening to stony Nakoda creation stories told by the Snow brothers who were here. And it was beautiful of how they came out of the mountain, what is now in, in a park called Banff. I've heard the Lakota creation stories of how they came out of the cave and came to be upon the territory. I've heard different versions of how we Cree came to be where we are on what we call Mother Earth or Turtle Island by others. What is common is that in each instance, we're in the middle of a good world. And I believe that all people who live in this place need to experience or can experience the land welcoming them home. A Cree elder from Northern Alberta says it's essential for Europeans, Euro-Canadians, to be able to develop a relationship with the land because so many of them have lost touch with their traditional lands where they came from. And they have no relation to land, so they have no real spirituality. They wander around like ghosts with no connection to the earth. Creation stories form our identity. Stan Grenz, writing about Christian theology, says that the scripture was to form a shared story for developing an ecclesial identity. Canada, however, needs a new creation story because the one of the benevolent Christian power that settled and improved the land and helped the indigenous people dig themselves out of brutish, short, bereft lives of hope, bereft, who, pardon me, this, the, the story of how the powerful, benevolent Christian power came and helped the indigenous people dig themselves out of their lives that were brutish, short, and bereft of hope does not work anymore. There's been attempts to develop Canadian shared narratives. There was one put forward by Stephen Harper and others that Canada was a country of explorers. There was a small vignette that was playing in theaters in Calgary just before I moved just the last couple years of uh, Stephen Harper's government, it was based on them finding the Franklin ships frozen in, up north. The, the explorer Franklin died up north, got lost and died. Canada is a country of explorers who got lost and die on the ice. I just didn't think it worked. I thought, you need a better story. That was not, that's no good. There are other explored myths. My daughter Catherine, when she was studying at McGill, found an account of David Thompson, was actually the people who were guiding David Thompson. And at one point, he's mad at his indigenous guides because he believed they should have arrived at the ocean by now. And the indigenous guides responded by telling him, well, why don't you lead then, since you seem to know everything? Returning to Franklin expedition, turns out indigenous people knew where it was the whole time, just no one ever bothered to ask the Inuit people about it because they had it in their oral tradition. You need a new national narrative. With all these terms, spirit, identity, spirituality, and law, even though I'm using them as nouns, I'm, under, I'm understanding them to contain a dynamic process that, that process that is always moving and changing. Spirituality is dynamic among us Cree. Perhaps that could be seen in our understanding of the great mystery that we use the word Gitsmanitu, that it's sometimes translated creator, mystery, big something, is understanding that our perspective is small and that we're always seeking understanding to live out a good way upon the earth. The Cree cosmology begins with acknowledgement that it is a good world. Harmony is built into creation and we human beings are the least wise among the creatures because all of the creatures understand by instinct how they are to live. We humans must be taught. And we need to be taught to learn to harness our free will, for we are creatures that cross over the boundaries at different times. Spirituality, then, is not like the Western concept of religion, although some have taken that route to try to gain a hearing for indigenous spirituality. Spirituality is about living life in a good relation, about all the relationships that I mentioned earlier between us and creation, between us and creator and the spirit beings, between us and our community and between our community and other communities. Creation itself teaches how to live in a good way, but we need the elders to help us develop a vision for living in this land. Our spirituality flows out of this idea that we live in a good land. And our spirituality and identity are tied to it. 
An example from northern Quebec, the walking out ceremony among, among the Cree. As soon as a young person is old enough, then they walk, they walk them out of their, their house. And if it's a boy, I know some will get upset with me, I'm sorry. I'm just telling you how it works. If it's a boy, they put meat on his back. And he's maybe two years old. And he walks to a house close to him. And when he comes in, all the people say, the hunter is here. The hunter is here and he's bought meat for the soup. The hunter is here. And as he gets older, it gets further distance that he walks. And the little girl, when she's two, they put they tie some sticks to her back and she walks to the she walks to the next house and they say, Oh good, the woman has brought some wood for the fire. And we can eat, we can cook. So good she's here. And you grow up understanding that you're an important part of the community. And it's based on the land. All these embrace a communal identity and spirituality is tied to the land. The land is sacred. And because at any point creator could do something powerful, the spirituality then flows out of the vision upon the land. It is communal with the presence of the elders who help to locate this vision within the communal memory and story of the people upon the land. And our law flows from creation. Indigenous law, according to John Burroughs, has a metaphysical element that is related to our creation stories. Western colonization was premised upon the idea that the native or primitive people of the New World did not possess laws. Indigenous people were thought, therefore, to be less than human that could be raised to the level of citizen by the new state or the new nation state imposing upon them the Western concept of law, this concept of law, which at times becomes legality that was used to justify, to take and remain in control of unceded land by declaring both the doctrine of discovery in the case of the Americas and terra nullius in Australia and British Columbia, Western law has become completely dominated by litigation and arguments over individual property rights. Indigenous law, on the other hand, flows from creation. It's helped us to understand how we relate it to all things and how our freedom is, a, is the gift for the community. Anthropologist Richard Preston, in writing about Cree narrative, observed that the Cree have a decentralized government that does not lead to anarchy. They control their world, he says, and I told my grandson this. We control our world by mental force. We use the force. <laughs> what he meant was the Cree grow up understanding how every one of their actions impact every one of their relationships. And they use their freedom for no one has the right to tell anyone what to do, but they use it for the good of everybody around them. The chiefs lead and diffuse tense situations by being the most gracious, generous, well-mannered individual in the room. True spirituality is identified in an individual but how they live in relationship with all things, not primarily based upon the words that people say but on the lives that people live. Indigenous identity and spirituality flow out from the creation story upon the land, which led naturally to the idea of treaty as a way to maintain respectful relationship with other First Nations and with the newcomers who came upon the land. Indigenous people have a history of making treaty as a way to share place that stands in sharp contrast to modern nations' propensity to try and enforce boundaries with more security. When the newcomers came, it ushered in a, an attempt it ushered in a significant change. First Nations leaders, as well as Métis and later the Inuit, see the necessity of forming a relationship with the newcomer. Remember that spirituality is built upon creation stories, and from these creation stories, we understand that the land is our relative, and we're related to all things, and we try to live that out. The land and animals are relatives, but we did not own the land in the way the Europeans thought you could own the land. It's not that indigenous people did not have possessions. Recently, Grand Chief Arthur Noski of Treaty 8 told me, 
we understand that we can only possess that which we can carry on our back. We can never possess the land. The land possesses us. We don't carry the land. The land carries us. Our spirituality and creation story demanded that we tell the newcomers into the story. Numerous prophets and indigenous communities have seen the coming of the Europeans so that when they came, we made treaty. At first, they were simple friendship treaties. Later, they became sometimes contracts where money was exchanged. Eventually, they, by the time the number of treaties came about, they, they became like covenants. Written, but the words spoken were what was important. Treaty, indigenous treaty, affirms, according to Stan Beardy, four things. It affirms the privilege of a peaceful existence, that everyone who comes should have a peaceful existence, the privilege of access to the land, the privilege of being fed from the bounty of the land, the privilege of being who Creator made us to be. And that's how we made treaty with the newcomers. For some of the signers of the newcomers the, of the treaty that I read about those in Saskatchewan, particularly the Lakota and Dakota, they understood that in the treaty process, we were becoming relatives. Indigenous spirituality, which was communal, was based upon a shortage story or communal narrative that included the land. So then migration seemed to be part of our understanding. And so when a new group or when you were an enemy with a group, you reconciled with them. You used the making relatives ceremony, black elk, a Catholic catechist, and Lakota holy man told the understanding of the making relative ceremony to different authors who wrote it down, that in order to effect reconciliation between indigenous groups, they would perform the making relative ceremony. They would do a mnemonic ritual to remind themselves of some of the sources of that enmity between them. They would then burn sweet grass and pray and would thus make peace and commit to live like relatives. When the signing of Treaty 4 and Treaty 6, this was the understanding of the elders. We promised to live like relatives. There was a Cree chief, Kakishawe, said he saw the government official who was also then the queen's son-in-law. He saw him far off and Kakishawe said, how is my brother-in-law today? He understood that he himself was a son to the queen through the treaty and that this official was a son to the queen by marriage. So he refers to him with a term for a relative, a brother-in-law. Indigenous people understood that we must become relatives since Canada was new to the land and Canadians were new to the land. The treaty was a way for them become, to become related to the land by coming into relationship with the original stewards of the land. We were to become like siblings. We would have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship and live within the shared space or place that is called Canada. Each individual indigenous nation of people understood this, this as applying to relationship with one another as well as to the newcomers. After all, indigenous people understood that these newcomers were human. Adrian Jacobs tell me that the Anishinaabe, they wanted to call the, in, the, the new Europeans Anishinaabe, which is basically just means human beings. But the Europeans didn't want to be called human beings. They wanted to be called something else. The treaty then involves more than the words written on the page, but forms a story that takes in the land creator and human beings. As narrative, it extends identity back to our ancestors. As we live out the law, they understood that flowed from creation story to maintain and steward this harmony. And as our storied identity is extended forward to include all who came after. Henry Morris, treaty commissioner, understood this treaty as covenant to use those words to describe what they were doing in Treaty 6. He says, today we're making a treaty, a treaty that will last for all time, for as long as the rivers flow and the grass grows. We are becoming one people, he said. We're becoming relatives. 
That's how the indigenous people understood it. It's a shared narrative because it is the story of the newcomers at wealth. It means newcomers must begin to assimilate to a relationship with land and first peoples. But the treaty ensures or presses us to make sure that we do not erase the difference between us. For it is this distance between us that we call honor and respect. And it is the space of collaboration for we could understand in this way diversity without being suspicious about it. This means we need greater emotional intelligence to be able to feel in a way that leads to healing and not greater animosity. It is a shared narrative that could be Canada's creation story to tell how Canada became related to this land, this earth. Its foundation then is not about Canada, maple leaf, the sign of the thief, but about how we came to heal together and how we heard this call to heal the land. And we implemented action call item number 45, call upon Canada and First Nations to issue a royal proclamation that as part of it renews the treaty relationship, that we would find a way to heal the land together by having a unity that does not devolve into tribalism or does not result in another form of imperialism and is built upon indigenous treaty that the newcomers were part of and is built upon creation and the law that flows from it. And it would be Canada's creation story and they would be a truly spiritual nation. Thank you. My name is Christina Conroy and I am pleased to see so many people here and I just want to acknowledge how many people are out listening to us um, in Zoom land. Uh, there are a number of church communities that are listening together and we have some study questions uh, that you can take up as small groups um, and you might want to build on them. They were written of course before we knew exactly what Dr. Aldred was saying um, but they give enough to, to begin the conversation. Uh, for my response tonight, I'm going to invite um, two of my students, former students, to, to come up and say a few words. And let me just explain a few things. Tonight we actually have the pleasure of having four brief responses. Um, we have esteemed guests here. I'm so pleased that all four of you in the front row could be here joining us. Uh, we're going to hear first from the two students, and then we have... Um, Tony Snow with us and his brother, Reverend John Snow. Um, so let me just explain uh, for a moment what, uh, what my students and I were, were thinking by way of response. Um, I teach a course on the, the history of residential schools in Canada. This is one of my areas of, of study. I was had the... Um, the privilege of taking part in many of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, live events across the, the country. Um, and my work honors the story of residential school students. Um, and like uh, Dr. Aldred, you said to us tonight, um, I have heard again and again Honorable Marie Sinclair say, uh, and the truth teller, Marie Sinclair, say at the end of a very hard lecture, let's be friends. Um, and of course, challenging us to take up this concept of what friendship looks like. I've had uh, folks here from the Calgary Alliance for Common Good uh, speaking to clergy and indigenous folks in relationship with each other say, that's an okay idea, but would you do that with a friend? Uh, and it's continually this invitation to a kind of deep, robust uh, friendship. And we've heard tonight, um, uh, well, I should also mention my Métis sister in Saskatoon who said, um, I don't mind working with you, but I need to know who you are before I work with you. 
And this idea of a shared narrative that we can heal the land together, um, this idea that we have our creation story, that we have our own relationship to this land, we, we took up as a class. And I was so deeply proud of my students for um, hearing um, Calgary Foundation has a, a video on their website that, uh, that films elders from the First Nations around Calgary describing what land acknowledgement means to them, describing their relationship to the land. And we took up this question, how did you come to be here? Who are you? What is your relationship to the land? And so my students wove their stories into um, the story of this place as we had come to hear it from the elders. And I'm so pleased that we have the uh, representatives of the Stony Nakoda Nation here with us tonight whose creation stories, uh, whenever you go hiking in the mountains, um, this, is, this is where their stories emerge from. And so I am going to introduce to you uh, two speakers first, um, and I will also introduce um, Tony Snow and his brother, who will follow. But first of all, I uh, will invite uh, Eddie Huezo up. He's one of our third year MDiv students here at Ambrose, and he serves as the president of the Seminary Student Council. Although he was born in Canada, he spent 15 years of his life in El Salvador, where his family is from. He currently attends Pathway Church in Cambrian with his wife, Ashley where he serves young adult leaders and is an occasional preacher. Uh, and he is a, a good student. Um, you never have a, a, a deficit of questions when Eddie is in class, and I'm so pleased that he took this up. Following Eddie, I'm going to invite J.J. Soriano to come up. J.J. is a full-time husband and father living in Calgary with his wife Maria and their two boys. His academic journey is a testament to the unpredictability of life. He holds a diploma in music performance from Mount Royal University, a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the Royal Military College of Canada, and he recently graduated from here with a Master of Divinity. JJ is currently a candidate for ordained ministry in the United Church of Canada and for chaplaincy in the Canadian Armed Forces. And so, um, Eddie, first, I will invite you to come, and JJ, you can follow. And I, I have Dr. Aldred sitting here because instead of having a, a question and answer period, um, we're going to give Dr. Aldred a, an opportunity um, just to speak to, respond to anything that, that he hears here tonight. Um, after these two, I will introduce the notes. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Edward Hueso Cañas. I was raised in El Salvador, uh, in Nahuapipil lands. I grew up surrounded by green mountains, mighty volcanoes, black sand beaches, and lively streams. The place that was closest to my heart was the ocean. It still is, actually. I remember my mother telling me to always ask the sea for permission before I went in the water because the sea was powerful and uh, I needed to show it respect. But once I was in, it didn't matter what I was burdened with because the waves would take it all away. My parents had two children, my younger sister and I. We grew up hearing my great aunt tell us stories of our family and the land we lived in. And so we learned who we were and how we were to be. Growing up, I had heard of Calgary because my grandmother and my parents met back here in, in the 1980s. In 2012, I moved to Three Hills, Alberta and, uh, to finish my undergrad studies, which I had started back in New York State. Two years later, I moved to Calgary with my sister, and I have lived here ever since. I never thought I would end up in the same place my parents met. But the Creator somehow saw fit to bring me back here. And I will never forget the first time I visited the Rockies. The snowy peaks, the tranquil lakes, 
the green forest and its rivers were for me a place where I once again could feel most like myself and a place where I found peace, rest, and clarity. I am here today in a land that has welcomed my ancestors and I as friends. I have learned, I have grown, I have fallen in love in this land. I call it home. So as I did for the ocean all those years ago, I want to show this land the respect it deserves by acknowledging it and giving thanks to its original caretakers, the Pikani First Nation, the Siksiga First Nation, the Ghana First Nation, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, and the Tutina First Nation. I would also like to acknowledge the members of the Meti community, more specifically Meti Region 3, who also calls this land their home. In the spirit of reconciliation, my hope is that we may, as was always intended with treaty, be partners and friends in this beautiful place we call home. I want to share with you, as in closing, a poem from my country, which I want to dedicate to my home. I'll read it in Spanish first, and then I'll read it in English. Dios te salve, patria sagrada. En tu seno hemos nacido y amado. Eres el aire que respiramos, la tierra que nos sustenta, la familia que amamos, la libertad que nos defiende, la religión que nos consuela. Tú tienes nuestros hogares queridos, fértiles campiñas, ríos majestuosos, soberbios volcanes, apacibles lagos, cielos de púrpura y oro. May Creator save you, sacred homeland. On your chest we are born and have loved. You are the air that we breathe, the land which sustains us, the family whom we love, the freedom which protects us, the belief which comforts us. You have our beloved homes, fertile plains, majestic rivers, superb volcanoes, peaceful lakes, and skies of purple and gold. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Conroy, for the introduction. It is a privilege to have this opportunity to give a response in the form of land acknowledgement to Dr. Aldred's very illuminating lecture. But first, I would like to greet you in my native language. Magandang gabi. Ako po si Jeriel Joseph Soriano. At ako ay nagpapasalamat sa ating dakilang Diyos at sa inyong lahat sa pagkakataon na ito. Good evening. My name is Jeriel Joseph Soriano, and I give thanks to the Creator and to each one of you for this opportunity. In the spirit of reconciliation, respect, and friendship, I would like to honor and recognize the different lands and their respective caretakers who have welcomed me and my family and who have shaped my journey and my story. I come from the island of Luzon in the Philippines, born and raised in the region of the Tagalog peoples, the people of the river, those who inhabited the land before the Spanish came and claimed her as their own. I grew up on land bordered by the country's largest lake to the north, and a dormant volcano to the south. I 
had learned and stayed under the shelter of this mountain, surrounded by the voices of insects, birds, and other creatures. I became acquainted with the various plants of that place, enjoying the generosity of the food they gave and the shade they offered. I learned their names, the languages of my grandmothers. I am grateful to this land and her caretakers. At the age of 15, I moved with my family across the ocean to Turtle Island, where we started our new life as immigrants in Treaty 7 on the traditional territories of the Siksika, Pigani, the Kainai, the Sutina, and Stony Nakoda Nations, and home of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. This land revealed a different kind of beauty. I was enraptured by her vast open skies. I was fascinated by her surprising seasons. And I was amazed by her majestic mountains. I am grateful to this land and her caretakers. After several years in this place, my journey took me east to the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. On this land, my wife and I made our first home, where we enjoyed strolling along Lake Ontario and we were mesmerized by the, the maple trees in the fall when their leaves turned the land into a palette of bright and golden yellow, tangerine and vermilion. We are grateful to this land and her caretakers. We then moved west to the unceded territories of the Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples. This land gave our family beautiful memories of breathing the salt-tinged air on the shores of the Salish Sea, of walking through the old growth forest near our home, and of carefully picking and tasting the abundant wild berries that grew in our backyard. We are grateful to this land and her caretakers. After five damp winters and five gorgeous summers, our family crossed the Salish Sea and the Rocky Mountains and came back to where I first found my home on Turtle Island, here in Treaty 7. This time, however, I see not just the beauty of this place, but also the wounds. I see how settler colonialism, unbridled capitalism, and a distorted view of Christianity continue to infect this land with a disease that discriminates, dehumanizes, and destroys cultures, languages, and lives. And as someone who inherited the chains of colonialism from my ancestors, I join those who pursue justice, those who desire dignity, and those who seek a better way forward of seeing each other's humanity and of coming together in community as I continue to learn and listen from the voices on the edges and as, and as I become who I need to be in building right relations with and bringing healing to the land 